Okay, welcome everybody. Very super excited to have you here. Tervetuloa kaikille. Ollaan tosi innoissaan, että uh, olette täällä. Ja tervetuloa kaikille myös, jotka seuraa live streaming kautta. Also welcome to everybody who's following us uh, through live stream. And we're going to talk mostly in English today because of our international guests. Um, but if anybody has any questions in Finnish or if there's any words or anything you don't uh, know in English, feel free to ask in Finnish. So we'll do our best uh, to translate. So just to quickly about our main agenda today. So we're going to first talk about something that's called Democracy Accelerator. Then we are going to have our main keynote speaker today, who is Digital Minister Audrey Tang from Taiwan. And then after Q&A with Audrey Tang, we are going to have another guest from Taiwan, Shuang Lin, who is here, who has prepared a really exciting VR demo for us to try, which is related to Audi and also which is related to um, a crowdsourced open lawmaking process that's ongoing here with the Ministry of Justice. And then we are going to switch to a VR demo at the end. And my name is Tanya Aitamuta. I'm assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I'm working on this democracy uh, accelerator project with my colleague uh, Julia Joselahti, who is senior advisor at Demos Helsinki, which is a Helsinki-based uh, think tank. And she's a wonderful partner in crime in making all these democratic innovations happen. But without further ado, let's go to our program. So let's talk about Democracy Accelerator a little bit. What is it? So you have seen this Democracy Accelerator thing coming up in our advertisements and here and there. So Democracy Accelerator has three main goals. The first goal is to inform all of us, you and ourselves, about democratic innovations that are happening all around the world. The second goal of ours is to inspire people to take action for a better democracy. Democracy that's more functional than the one that we have today. And over time, we hope to be able to develop ourselves into a global hub for democratic innovations. And then how are we going to actually make that happen? One uh, way, one method that we are doing that is that we are publishing case studies, like introductions about democratic innovations in different parts of the world. Here in Finland, um, in France, in Taiwan, everywhere. If you go to our website, democraticinnovations.com, you will see some of these case studies that we have been working on lately. For instance, if I just quickly introduce a couple of the case studies uh, projects that we are working on currently, one of them is a crowdsourced open lawmaking process with the Ministry of Justice. Actually, Jyrki Jauhiainen from Ministry of Justice is here. Um, he's a, a senior legal advisor or something like that. Sorry, I forget your title. But in this process, what's happening is that the Ministry of Justice is asking people's feedback in a law reform process. This law is about association acts, and it basically governs how people can self-organize themselves in associations. And just today, actually, the crowdsourcing process was launched like uh, an hour ago, so we just got the link up. If you go to this link, toimintaan yhdessä inhousebase.com, so you see a crowdsourcing platform where you can leave your comments and questions about the law. Uh, also, we have projects about constructive journalism. And in these projects, the idea is to figure out how could journalism, journalistic publications like newspapers, other type of media, take a more constructive, solution-oriented role in journalism. So, for instance, there has been some events collecting Finnish people together to deliberate about societal values. And then um, similar events are going to be going to happen over the course of next year all around Finland. Also, there is a really big project about participatory budgeting with the city of Helsinki, city of uh, Vanta, and other cities in Finland, where many researchers are developing evalu evaluation tools to figure out what type of in impact participatory budgeting has on democratic values and processes. And there is many more. So if you go to our website, democraticinnovations.com, or in Finnish, demokratia kiirittämä, uh, .fe. Uh, so you, you will find more information about these projects. And of course, we are not doing all this work ourselves. We have a big team of researchers and professors who are working on these projects. And on our website, you will find more information about that too. But of course, then we are interested in your projects. So if you're working on a democratic innovation, any experiment that uh, tries to include more people, make our society more equal, we would love to hear about it. So we would ask you to consider sharing your project 
with the idea that you would just answer very simple questions that we have. Uh, we have those up on our website. There's a template. You just respond what your project is about, what is your story or the background story of your project, and so on. And that's the way we get some information and we can highlight your project. And the idea why we are doing it this way is that we think that the more information we have ourselves and the more we share it forward, the stronger our democracies become. Because I've seen in my work, um, as uh, I've been doing research about open government and uh, transparency and so on for about 10 years, and I see that many people are trying to reinvent the wheel in different parts of the world. So somebody is doing a really interesting project in Chile, for instance. Another one is doing a similar project in Norway, and these people are not talking to each other. And they are facing similar challenges. They are experiencing similar type of victories. But if we would share this, that would amplify our voices. So that's our goal. We want to be that platform for all of you guys. And then if you think about Democracy Accelerator and its goal, and think about what democratic innovations are, because that, that's a really relevant question. Innovation and democracy are really big word, and it's not maybe easy to comprehend what they mean. But what we mean by democratic innovations is that there are any initiatives, big or small, that try to make our society more equal, more transparent, more inclusive. And uh, these projects can be small or big, new or old, uh, have been going on for a while. Also, these projects that we're interested in can be done by individuals, groups or organizations. So we are really interested in your projects in, with a really broad sp spectrum. And thinking about just summarizing what Democracy Accelerator is, what we want to do is that we want to experiment, uh, do different types of projects, uh, within trying to improve democracy in different ways, with new technologies, with new types of participatory methods, and so on. And that's our way to develop democracy further. And then we do research, academic research and publishing based on these findings we have. And if you are interested in our work uh, further, you can go on our website, dem democraticinnovations.com. Uh, in Finnish, demokratiakirjutumabistefi. Also on social media, you can find our handles uh, in multiple places in Finnish and English. And here, um, especially people uh, who are on live streams, so you see you can leave comments and ideas there and questions on the live stream platform. So we are monitoring those throughout the live streaming and we will um, take your questions and uh, present those to Shu Yang and Audrey. And also, if you have questions to ask, you can ask there. And also, people who are here in the audience, you can also go to this um, uh, live uh, the, the chat mode, and then you can ask, post your questions and comments there. So now we are going to move on to our upcoming events and a little bit more about the background of the project, and Julia will talk about those. Uh, so like I said, uh, we don't believe that only a website will do change anything, but we believe it, it's actually people coming together to share learnings and uh, spar each other. So that's why we want to bring the Democracy Accelerator um, together uh, next time in October uh, 22nd here in Audi. Uh, so please welcome everyone who is interested in developing democracy, who maybe has a project uh, or you have been working around uh, this developing democracy and want to learn from others or share your tips to others. Um, so we're really trying to make this um, like a really low threshold community uh, because we think that's how uh, ideas spread and that's how we learn from each other and that's how we eventually make uh, democracy better. Uh, so 22nd of October, but please follow our uh, social media sites and uh, uh, you'll get more information of the event. Um, and uh, that's what you get to work um, in the workshop, like said. So share your work on democracy, get feedback from others, and resolve challenges that you may have. Um, and this link will be posted to our channels uh, later again. Uh, but uh, just a few words about the background of, uh, of Democracy Accelerator. Uh, so we are not only accelerating democracy through experiments, but also um, doing really high quality research on the topic. Um, so, uh, Democracy Accelerator is part of a uh, five-year-long uh, five um, research project funded by the Finnish Academy called Tackling Biases and Bubbles in Participation, BIBU. Um, and the idea in, in this long uh, research process is to um, examine uh, how have globalization and the structural changes in economy changed uh, people's political values and participation. 
Uh, so, and, and we ask that uh, due, to the, due to these changes, are there some people uh, who are uh, uh, whose voice is not heard in political uh, decision making? Are there bubbles that, I mean, this is a claim we hear a lot, that there are these bubbles where people don't communicate to other people who have different values and opinions. So are there actually, are the, are, are the bubbles real? Um, and, um, and yeah, so how, how, has, uh, how have the political values and participation of people changed within the last decades when many big transformations have happened in the society? Um, so, and it's done with the top researchers from, from various uh, Finnish universities and other uh, research institutes. So please also follow Bibu, so bibu.fi uh, uh, to, to stay up to date on the latest um, research on, on this super interesting theme of how democracy is changing. Um, and like I said, this is funded by the Finnish Academy and the Strategic Research. And I have to say, I'm really happy. Uh, perhaps you've also been following uh, uh, the publication of the new government program. So there it says that the next, uh, the next government is uh, or wants to promote new, more vari varying ways uh, of civic participation. And they have mentioned, for instance, um, participatory budgeting. So I think our timing is matching pretty nicely. So we are actually um, experimenting those new ways of promoting civic engagement and also uh, doing high quality research on that. Uh, so I hope we can uh, support the next government in their important work. Um, and any ideas or questions or comments, uh, please contact uh, myself and Tanya. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Okay, so now we're gonna switch to our... Oh, first, let's take some questions or comments now from the audience. If you have any questions regarding Democracy Accelerator, Democratia Kiritama, what we are doing, if you have any hopes or ideas what we should be doing, we are happy to hear it now here from the live audience or from the live stream audience. We have the um, the Screenio link. Let's find it again. It was... Screen.io slash demos. Yes, okay. Or if you have any tips to us, what should be done in Finland to make democracy better? Exactly. We're happy to hear it now or then uh, later online. Any comments or questions now? Uh, Teemu Ropponen has a question. Do we have the, yeah. the mic? We need to. Yeah, for the live streaming. And also, if you want, uh, if you could always introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Hi, everybody. Uh, Tem Roppunen from My Data Global and Open Knowledge Finland. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I missed it, uh, uh, but did you have a definition for a democratic innovation? Like, like what's the one-liner definition of that? Yeah, we did. Um, so basically, democratic innovations are any initiatives that try to make our democracy more equal, transparent and inclusive. So we are taking on a very broad definition for practical purposes. Uh, in academic research, there are many schools who define democratic innovations in different ways. But basically, it can be an innovation within the existing institution. So for instance, uh, what Jyrki, who is sitting behind you, is doing at the Ministry of Justice. So he's reforming, doing democratic innovations within the established practices and systems. So that's one way to do democratic innovations. Um, other ways to be, a, for instance, a nonprofit or just group of individuals who are then uh, doing something um, who that includes more people, tries to include more diverse people, uh, make, for instance, uh, have create more accessible services for certain type of groups who represent minorities and so on. So it's very, very broad definition, and hopefully it serves the purposes we have. That was a good question, thanks. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, move on to Audrey Tang, who is on standby all the way in Taiwan. And uh, I don't even know what the time difference is. Xu Yang probably knows. <laughs> How five, hours. five hours. Okay. So anyway, so Digital Minister Audrey Tang, she's going to talk about democratic innovations in Taiwan. And uh, that's a very super exciting topic because 
I'm really impressed by the work that uh, Audrey and her team, including Xu Yang, has been doing in the past years in Taiwan. There's so much going on that the 20 or 30 minutes we have with Audrey will not be able to cover all the fantastic work that's being done there. And Audrey just arrived from, returned back to Taiwan from Canada, where she was participating in the uh, annual Open Government Partnership event, which is a global event for all people working on open government projects. So maybe in the Q&A, we can hear the latest news about the OGP community too, which would be super exciting. And I, I got to see, I was lucky to see Audrey's talk a couple of years ago, I think it was in Paris, in an open government event. And I was really impressed and fascinated by her work. And then we were lucky to have her to dedicate some time to, to do this um, talk here. So we are super excited about it. And a little bit about Audrey's background. Um, before she came, um, assumed the position of digital minister, which is first in that type of kind, in that post new minister um, uh, position in Taiwan. She was a hacker or um, how would I call programmer, developer, uh, did some work in Silicon Valley. So we could call um, her as a veteran of democratic innovations, even before assuming the job as a digital minister. So with this, um, Audrey, are you ready to, to start your talk and take it away? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And thank we are you super the, excited to have you here. All right. Um, thank you for the great introduction. And um, I hope the sound is getting through because we t uh, spend a lot of time testing. So um, I'm really happy to be here virtually to talk about democratic innovations. Um, and just as Tanya has introduced, I've been working on um, technologies, web technologies, to facilitate this kind of collective decision making um, since I was 15 years old. Uh, that was 1990, 96, 1996. Um, and I discovered that the future of human knowledge is on the wild web and all my textbooks were out of date. So at the time I told my teachers I want to quit school and start my education on the wild web. And surprisingly, all my junior high school teachers agreed with it. And so I quit school and founded startups working on web technologies. And I get to join this fabulous internet community that runs this, this crazy idea. It's an open multi-stakeholder political system that still powers the internet to this day. And so today as Taiwan's first digital minister, I'm putting into practice the idea that I learned when I was 15 years old, and that's rough consensus, civic participation, and radical transparency. And so let's try out a democratic innov innovation right now. Um, it's called the QR code, which is very um, mundane technology. But um, if you have a QR code scanner, I would encourage you to scan this QR code um, that's being projected on the screen. Um, and if it works, um, you should get into this anonymous forum uh, where you can just uh, not just ask me questions, uh, but also like each other's questions. And so during my talk, um, anyone can just type in questions for other people to like. So it's like a way to vote. Um, and if you cannot scan the QR code, you can also go to slido.com and enter the uh, numbers 00603. And Somebody has figured it out, that's great. And so um, my talk will be entirely crowdsourced, meaning that um, the content of my talk will be driven by whatever the question is posted on Slido. And so for example, this person said, hello, this is so cool. And I, I will be like, yeah, it's cool, isn't it? And then I'll just close it. And then said someone said Taiwan number one, and so on. And so please just keep the questions um, coming and uh, that will determine the content of my talk. Um, there's one person that said uh, they want to hear about my alternative schooling. Um, I'm very happy to share with that. So just um, as a background, let me show you my office. So this is uh, literally my office. It's Social Innovation Lab uh, in Taiwan. It's in the Taipei City. Uh, and the reason why I drop out of junior high school is not that I want to study at home. It's rather I want to study at places like this. Uh, and at a time, um, there's many different uh, co-ops, there are different movements springing around Taiwan. Collectively, we call it the social sector. And the social sector in Taiwan uh, is 
responsible for social innovation, just like the private sector focuses on industrial or economic um, innovation. And social innovation um, basically in Taiwan means that any innovation from the social sector that everyone can participate and is to the benefit of everyone. So public participation, public benefit. For example, um, I made friend during my alternate schooling with a group of people um, called the Keras Foundation or the Children RS Foundation. And the Keras Foundation is responsible today for this public art in the social innovation lab here. So if you see this soccer field, it is the work of people with Down syndrome or with trisomy differences. Um, we may see the world through the lens of text and numbers, but people with Down syndrome see the world through the lens of geometry. So it turns out that um, if they uh, paint the word world that they see, uh, we can make them into public art that is just like art from Van Gogh or other artists that inspire people to be very creative whenever they step into this uh, place. So my main learning um, when I was alternative to school is just I seek out those places where it's called open spaces where everybody can contribute but has a way to just include more people and their contributions. And so I uh, brought this um, habit even as a digital minister. Every Wednesday, everybody can find me in the social innovation lab from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And they get to talk to me for 40 not just interviews, is also uh, open to everybody to see. And this is important because as a democracy, if we just um, publish the work that we do without explaining the why, or more importantly, if um, we just publish the thing we do without explaining the alternatives that we have evaluated and decided not to do, it is impossible for the people to follow uh, the work that we do. And so as a digital minister, I made sure that everything in the draft stage that I publish, including people's visits in the social innovation lab is published online. And so this is like a virtual school for everybody to be a virtual digital minister that can participate in my daily work. And so we get a lot of very interesting visits uh, from people, uh, for example, from the MIT Media Lab to bring their self-driving vehicles. Um, these are self-driving, but they are tricycles and they are very uh, slow, meaning that they don't harm people if they run into people. And importantly, this is social innovation because it's open source and open hardware, meaning that if you don't like the way that it looks or how it integrates to the society, you can fork it, meaning that you can take it and change it to some other different way. And so basically, people just hacked locally um, for it to have two eyes, it can wink at you, it can have a different norm integrating with the society and things like that. And this is how we spread the idea of social innovation so it reaches more people. And again, because as a junior high school dropout, I depend heavily on the open source projects online, on, uh, for example, the Gutenberg project and later on the archive project and later on um, the Wikipedia project to fuel the education. I made sure that everything, all the transcript, all the work we publish online is under an open source license or creative common license. And so I think that is the kind of education that I received from the open source community. And this is the lessons that I apply the same things so that um, the other junior high school dropouts in Taiwan or not necessarily dropouts can participate meaningfully in the democratic process. And it's really working. For example, we have an e-petition platform and the most uh, impactful petitions online. We have 23 million people in Taiwan, about 5 million participate in that e-petition uh, platform. And we see the most active petitioners are people who are around 15 years old and people around 65 years old. So these two age groups 
think more about public benefit and less about private um, benefit. And the 15 years old came up with, um, for example, um, petitions to ban plastic straws uh, from drinks. Uh, and that is concerning the environment because naturally they are younger, so they have uh, they are at a business end of climate change, of environmental pollution, and things like that. And the beauty about e-petition is that a 15 years old doesn't even have to have a legal age to vote or to get into the referendum. They can still meaningfully participate. And indeed, this year in Taiwan, we banned the use of plastic straws for indoor drinking just because the petition of 15 years old, so that they don't have to, you know, uh, abandon school on their Fridays as they do in Europe. Uh, anyway, so uh, that is um, a public participation as a form of schooling. Um, Timu would like to know, um, love the radical transparency and um, let me just, yes. Uh, have you thought about being transparent how the government used personal data of citizens? Uh, for example, transparency in daily actions. This is a excellent question. Uh, and a short question, um, I think um, it lies over a lot of important nuances. Um, so I will uh, just show you one concrete example of how we're handling this. Right. So in Taiwan, uh, when we think about data, we don't think about oil. We don't think about assets. We don't see data as anything like a physical asset. Think about it, it doesn't make sense, uh, right? Oil can only be extracted by a few places and everybody can just set up a air quality sensor in Taiwan, 2000 of the citizen scientists do and become a data steward. So it's not like oil, everybody can produce data. And if somebody transfer a barrel of oil to another country, they have one less barrel of oil. So it's scarce. But if I copy data to you, we're both richer. So data is abundant. I think data is nothing like oil. The only reason why there was this metaphor in the first place was that both were difficult to extract meaning, to extract insight and things like that. But in Taiwan, we have a lot of uh, people who just have free access to the world's top 20 supercomputing facility called the Taiwania um, supercomputer. And if you're a high school student, if you're in K-12, you have free access so that you can do in-place computation with a lot of GPUs on all those collected data from the air quality, from the water quality, from disaster, um, advanced disaster management, and also from earthquake prevention and things like that. And so this is people's daily contribution to the data collaboration. And as I mentioned, around 2000 people or more in Taiwan set up those air boxes, which are less than 100 euros each, and they can measure very quickly their air qualities and upload it to a distributed ledger, also known as blockchain, but I prefer distributed ledger so that we can make sure nobody can change each other's numbers and we can make meaningful uh, collaborations out of those uh, environmental data. So this is personal, but of course this is not private. Uh, we, we say personal in the sense of personal computer, meaning that everybody can be a data steward. We say private, meaning that it is not meant to be shared by default. So for private data in Taiwan, we don't see it as any kind of open data. In Taiwan, when we say private data, we say that it is a fiduciary relationship. You trust your doctor, your accountant, your psychiatrist, um, your nurse or whomever you trust uh, with your private data. And it's the same thing as with the government. Data in that context is a beginning of a trust relationship and the data steward need to earn the trust from the people. And so basically we use the same framework as Europe's um, privacy framework in our private data law. And we are now getting really quickly, I think, um, the GDPR adequacy from the European Union as well. And so we're firmly on the European side when it comes to personal data. It begins a relationship where you can demand accountability of portability, explainability and things like that from the data operator. If they don't warrant your trust, you just take your data elsewhere. And as the state, uh, we cannot really ask you to stay, uh, take data elsewhere. So we need to be maximally transparent when it comes to explain the use of personal data. 
And so if uh, personal data is used uh, for data collaboratives, we never publish the data. Instead, we only publish the statistics. And the statistics, of course, can be improved by this uh, way called open algorithm, where people contribute better aggregate algorithms so that people can make use of better statistics, but it may never uh, be re-identifiable even indirectly to any uh, specific people. And so this is our general line of thinking. It is just making use of better open algorithm to make better statistics, to make better data collaboratives. Uh, I hope that this is making some sense. Um, okay, um, I see that we are. Okay, so the next question uh, from Slido um, is that how can we make participation broader and more inclusive? Again, a great question. I think participation is only meaningful if we bring technology to people instead of asking people to come to technology. So using digital technology, we only augment and never replace face-to-face -face conversations. And so this is why our co-founder Shu Yang is with you now, so you can have more face-to-face -face conversations. But even for the um, regional innovation tours, for example, this is a case where we just tour around Taiwan, discovering more social innovations like the airbox and ask them what they want out of the central government. And in this setting, just like my Wednesday office hour, it is face-to-face -face, but amplified through digital technologies. In the regional tours, uh, for example, in an indigenous people's uh, region or a rural place or a um, offshore island, uh, we benefit from Taiwan's um, stance of broadband is a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, no matter how remote it is, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's my fault personally, you can talk to me. And so because of that, no matter how remote the meetings are, we're guaranteed to have sufficient bandwidth to connect the local people to the ministries, the central ministries in Taipei City. And it's every other Tuesday or so that we make these tours. Um, and so those tours bring together people in Taipei, in Kaohsiung, in Taichung, and in Taoyuan, so that they look at each other and at the rural places eye to eye. And this is uh, somewhat magical in that if, if you have a high resolution video feed, you tend to build sympathy even if we're not on the same places. Like right now, because we have good high uh, definition camera going both ways, I can see whether you're interested or whether you're bored and things like that. And that uh, builds affinity between the both sides. And if we, and thank the camera person for just panning as I'm saying this. So in any case, what I'm getting at is that previously, the democratic participation doesn't scale across different municipal and rural levels, mostly because people were not on the same room. So they just get a synthetic document or a few pages of PowerPoint or whatever, but they cannot really feel the empathy of what really is going on in those rural places. But because I personally travel, I stay a night or two nights in that locality to do ethnographic well, just hanging out uh, with, with local people. Uh, and that makes it much possible to, for people to have empathy with the central governments. And another good thing about this regional innovation tools is that previously, even if the Ministry of Economy or of Interior goes to a place and they discover that they have to talk with the Ministry of uh, health and welfare or the Minister of Transportation, uh, they often do it in a way that loses context um, as uh, it passes through the bureaucracy. But now, because all the 12 ministries are in the same room and they get into the habit of being in the same room in the innovation lab, enjoying good food, good drink, uh, and sometimes also mu music, they build uh, empathy also between the ministries and they can just brainstorm right there uh, toward a common value even if they have different positions. And so this is also a way to iterate more quickly around the different values that each ministry represents. Because each ministry, of course, 
uh, represents different value in the society. But if we get them into the same room, they're much easier to discover their common values and deliver on the innovation that realize those values instead of on the bad old days where each ministry is like fighting um, each other and you don't see it because the rope in the middle is invisible. But because of radical transparency, uh, the space in the middle becomes visible now and it creates a powerful initiative uh, for the career public service to innovate because previously in the bad old days, if things go right, the minister take all the credit. And if things go wrong, the minister always blame the public servants and who are anonymous and uh, really cannot fight back. But now with radical transparency, it's the other way around. Um, if things go right, we always highlight the person that actually delivers the innovations. For example, in one of the e-petitions, about reinventing the tax filing system. We have the participation officer, a team of people in each ministry in charge of talking to petitioners. And we have Yang Jingheng here who just volunteered to talk directly with the petitioner to make a tax filing system together. And so we just highlight all the good work the career public service done because it's radically transparent. And because uh, this is uh, very new, and so if things go wrong, it is always my fault. And so because I absorb the blame and they get the credit, you get much more innovation from the career public service when it comes to uh, digital innovations like this, when we can bring everybody to the same room and absorb the risk and share the credit. Uh, and let's look at, so there's five questions now. Um, I, I will um, try to get to all of it, but I don't promise anything. Okay. So uh, um, the top question at the moment says, did I understand correctly that you're the first digital minister? How has the journey been? Are there any challenges and any highlights? A great question. So um, I'm a horizontal minister, meaning that there is no digital ministry in Taiwan. Every ministry need to undergo digital transformation. And so my office is literally one person poached from each ministry. So uh, this is a very new configuration. Taiwan has never tried this before. And I only ask for volunteers. So it means that at most I can have 32 colleagues because Taiwan has 32 ministries in the central government. But in reality, I only have 20 colleagues or so. That means um, uh, one third of the ministries are not sending people to my office with understandable reason, because I asked them to work out loud, to share their work with all the other ministries. So we don't have the Ministry of Defense, for example, or the Ministry of PRC Affairs, uh, understandably. Um, and it's only after a year or so did the Ministry of Foreign Affairs send someone to my office. But the offices, the ministry, that want to talk to people, like the ministries of education, of interior, of um, communication, um, of uh, culture. They, they all have people in my office because their work is to reach out maximally um, to people. And so that is voluntary association and it's going really well. And the second uh, condition I have entering the cabinet, as you have seen, is radical transparency. And we had to negotiate constantly with the public service until the radical transparency is comfortable with them. So we finally settled on any meeting that I chair, we edit together for two weeks, so 14 days. And after two weeks, we publish the transcript. So every public servant sound very professional in the transcript because they have the time to take out the in jokes, to take out the unprofessional parts of public service. But still, it takes work to edit those. So by default, most things are still out in the open uh, in the policy making. And the great thing about that is that I'm also a channel from the collective intelligence and using crowd moderated tool. I also bring back consensus to the people so people can see that it is a reflective space that I'm really bringing back the consensus from people. And so this is I think very interesting um, that I have been able to negotiate this radical transparency and that is still running now and other ministries are now picking this up. And finally, I want to talk about location independence. No matter where I am, 
I can work as digital minister. There is a regulation in Taiwan that says if any public servant has their work related to internet, they can work anywhere and in any time zone. And so that enable us to have like 20 or so interns every year, actually 30 interns every year. They are all around Taiwan. Some of them are even in Canada, um, but they can still be a uh, uh, fruitful participation with um, the PDIS, with our office. And so I think these three conditions location independence, voluntary association, and radical transparency work together to create a theory of change that makes it much easier uh, to work across silos and to lead horizontally. And so that is my highlight. And the other question is asking, what is the role of the government in open government? This is a great question. I think the idea, very simply put, is that we're the government used to be before open government asking who are the organizers and what is the fair trade off between those organizers. That was the old question the government asks. It worked before the mobile internet and before the social internet because it's easier to organize in a hierarchical fashion. But now uh, with the social internet, anyone can organize quickly using a hashtag alone. And so if we just create one ministry or one office for each trending hashtag, the government will just go out of business really quickly. And so the government need to ask a different set of questions. We need to ask, given our different positions, are there common values? And given the common values, are there innovation that works for everyone? And I think it is the government's role to allow for innovations in this kind and show people that actually people have much more in common with their neighbors than the popular media has led them to think. I don't know about in Finland, but in many democracies, the popular media and some social media only focus on the statements that are dividing the country, that are dividing the population. So people get into this false uh, impression that they have most opposition with their neighbors. But using new technologies, new um, online platforms, we discover that we can always show people a reflection of their actual preferences and that most people actually agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things most of the time. And so I think it is the government's role to be a reflex space and let people not only reflect on the public policy, but make it fun to reflect on public policy. And for example, what you're seeing here is the real uh, screen of the AI power conversation through Polis that we had when Uber first entered Taiwan using amateur drivers. And people see that they have different social media friends, their families and so on, who are on different sides as them. So this is their avatar, and this may be their cousin or their mother or whatever. Uh, but even if people have different positions, they're still friends and families, they're not nameless enemies, right? They just didn't talk about Uber over dinner. And so the idea of making such a deliberative space is that people can share the same facts and have a safe place to share their feelings about the same facts. And there's no right or wrong about feelings. And then ideas, the best ideas are the ones that take care of most people's feelings. And finally, the government can see the rough consensus and turn them into regulation. So another example, this time of autonomous driving, of people who have some experience with, for example, self-driving tricycles, and then they can collectively decide the norm around which um, regulation should there be for experimentation of self-driving vehicles. So if there is only one image you can take away from my talk, uh, please keep this uh, image in mind. Every time when we run conversation like this, we make sure that there is no reply button. There is no reply button. If you take out the reply button, there's no way for trolls to influence the conversation. You can only upvote or downvote each other's sentiments or post something else for other people to resonate. But without a reply button, there is no way to hijack the conversation or make it a personal attack. And so you always end up with this shape if you don't have the reply button. But if you add the reply button, 
I guarantee you that you will end up with the mirror image of this shape. And so taking out the reply button is very useful. And we do this on the ePetition platform, on the Polis platform, and also on Slido. And you will know that there is no reply button when we use Slido. So I hope that answers the question somewhat. Um, let's see, um, there's nine questions now. The more I answer, the more questions there are, isn't it? Um, okay, um, so I'll, I'll try to be a little bit quicker, I guess, um, in my answers, otherwise I won't get to all of them. Um, the top question at the moment says, uh, from Kate, says in Taiwan, some elders are not interested in technology, so they don't see those information. What, what is the suggestion? Um, obviously, uh, what we do is that we bring the technology to the elders. We don't ask the elders to come to technology. So it is very important if the e-petition is about a local matter. We always travel all the different ministries together, travel to that locality to have a town hall conversation. Basically, we augment the existing way of participation. We just make sure that we amplify it, we record it online, and we make sure that the conversation is not go to waste, that we continue the conversation, but we don't force the elders to use the apps and so on. But on the other hand, that probably apply only to the really old people. Uh, people around 65 years old in Taiwan are the most active um, next to the 15 years old on our e-participation platform anyway. Um, and so I think the really old people, we made sure that they can participate also meaningfully near their locality. And we made sure that we um, amplify their wisdom by attending the meeting with them. Sometimes with just a 360 camera and then broadcasting the work uh, for everybody to look at. And I think uh, we can, of course, improve on this, but uh, there is already a lot of uh, experiment and Shu Yang will share some of it um, to you uh, when it comes to just including uh, people who are elders or live uh, closer to a vicinity, to a, a place into this kind of conversation. And that is also the motivation behind Holopolis, because when I showed my grandmother, who is 87, 88 years old now uh, of my work, I just use a Oculus, so she doesn't need any time to learn um, how to operate. It feels intuitive. She is just dropped into a conversation directly in virtual reality. So the less intermediary she has go to go through, the more useful that it will be for her in uh, to share her wisdom. And also because my grandpa, um, one of uh, my grandpa is 101 years old now, it's also more convenient uh, for him using VR because he really cannot walk really quickly um, as a 101 year old. But but at home uh, with Robin as human right, he can um, take the VR and feel that he is in a place for other people to have a real conversation. And I think that also uh, enables the social inclusion for really old people. Um, the other question says, uh, do you see or accept any limitation to radical transparency? Of course, as I said, uh, we're not live streaming everything, right? That would be violent uh, transparency. Radical transparency, the radical here means transparency at root, meaning that uh, we are transparent even when we have no idea, even when we're just brainstorming, even when we're just seeing an emerging issue in the society and, and just having a, a brainstorm session about it. We're transparent even before we deliver a policy from the government. And transparency at the root doesn't mean transparency uh, in a violent fashion. Because if you're publishing using live streaming, the person holding the two-dimensional camera wield all the power and it's actually very violent. Um, and so what we do instead is more uh, nuanced sharing using transcripts, using uh, a, a um, for example, what we call the real-time board, but it's called Miro now, um, a uh, visualization of people's arguments. We share things in a way that uh, appeals to people's different modalities and even comic books, but we don't share um, the violent two-dimensional uh, video feed unless everybody in the room agrees to it. And so this is the limit of radical transparency on the transparency side, because what we are doing is just to make trust easier. We're not doing transparency for transparency's sake. So radical is more important than transparency. How do we address the challenges uh, in implementing radical transparency? 
first of all, I think it's always easier if you have only volunteers in the beginning, people who are eager for the public to know their work instead of going straight to the Ministry of Defense and I say, oh, I want to publish all your Security Council meetings. Of course, that will not work, right? And so if you only talk first to the ministries of uh, justice, of culture, of communication and education, chances are that they will be re very receptive to this idea. And if you offer to lower the cost of generating the transcript, there are some really good um, AI system now that when working together with good microphones and with uh, court re uh, reporters, stenographers, they can work together and to deliver a better visibility into their work. And so then after a while, people will start to see it actually reduce their work. And so in our e-participation platform, at the beginning, we only have participation from the 60 or so projects, the major projects and a few ministries in this radical transparency around procurement, around spending, around government contract. But now we have participation from pretty much everybody in all the ministries. And so open contract is a very important idea because in Taiwan, in the e-participation platform, everybody can see which are the projects that are people caring the most. People care about long-term health care. So elders actually are probably the people who ask the most question here about water and sanitation, social housing, collaboration of data, uh, food safety, disaster prevention, and also uh, the third uh, building of our national uh, Taoyuan airport. And so in each of those government projects, and you can see there's almost 2,000 of the projects and initiatives, you can see what they did this quarter or this month. You can see how much money it spent, what procurement or research it did. And you can see a discussion board here. And every quarter, the Minister of Health and Welfare posts a summary reply saying, this is why we changed this quarter thanks to all your input. And at the beginning, people were very resistant to this idea. They were like, this will massively increase our workload. And so we only ask for volunteers. So like only 60 projects out of 2000. But then they all reported, actually, they reduced their workload because people don't call them as often. Previously, people just called them randomly asking, where is the project going? We don't see it anything on the media and they have to answer the same question, even if 40 people has already asked the same question um, using different phone calls in the previous week. But now they have to only answer once. Sometimes they just ask the question themselves and then um, just answer it online. And it makes sure that people can very easily using search engines to find out where the project is going. So they don't ask a lot of problems and questions if they can just discover itself. And even if they ask follow-up questions, it's of a deeper and a higher quality because they can always just reply saying, oh, you can look at this web page and then we can talk. And so having this public accountable response of all the budget related discussions actually saves time to people who participate. But you cannot really just convince this with our first hand experience. So we run the first year like a sandbox that basically showed everybody that it actually saves people's time. And then all the ministries decide to join. And that's why we have almost 2000 budget items now on the e-participation platform. Um, Kate would like to thank me for letting Taiwan to being seen. Um, okay, um, it's my uh, pleasure. Um, are you ever afraid that the world and the democracy becomes too digital? This is a great question. Um, I think the digital at the moment feels like a different place compared to the physical only because that the devices themselves are still too far away from people. So when it was um, personal computers, it felt closer to everyday life uh, than the mainframes. And when there is mobile devices, it feels closer to life than the personal computers. Now it's um, the earphones and the pencil and the watch. So it feels even closer. So once we're close enough in our daily physical life and uh, digital life, I don't think there will be a um, distinction between the digital and the physical. 
Now, people worry, of course, about addiction uh, to social media and so on all the time, which is true because we have companies like Facebook that are exactly like tobacco or liquor um, co uh, companies that basically sells addiction uh, that satisfies a proxy of a human need. But that is because they don't actually satisfy the human need. So it builds just like junk food or bad liquor, a addiction that is bad for the mental health. But if we teach the children to be data stewards, to run their own social media um, federations, to be essentially connoisseurs um, uh, who can taste uh, a good wine from a bad wine, then it's less likely that they will get addicted to junk social media. So I think the worry of being too digital is actually the worry of being addicted to something that is not conductive to human experience. And that is why we work very um, closely on, for example, broadband as human right, because we see if we have high quality, high definition video like we have now, it is easy for us to truly understand each other. But if we only have a bad bandwidth connection, uh, you, you can just project all your different thoughts and feelings on each other, and it often leads to a more divisive uh, population. And so I think it's essential that we make the bandwidth as broad as possible and that we augment the spaces as much as possible instead of working purely a asynchronous mode. And if we can work in synchronous mode all the time, I think in the next 10 years, maybe there will be no digital ministers anymore. Maybe all the ministries will be digital and we just have one analog minister um, in the cabinet. And I look forward to that day. Uh, and so we have 15, uh, 15 minutes more. So um, let's see, what happens after people participate with the e-platform? How does the idea proceed from there toward a possible implementation? That is a great question. So basically, every month, uh, all the participation officers look at those petitions and bring the topic that they feel needed to be discussed in the interagency way. So for example, if an e-petition is only just about one agency and that agency is already doing the work anyway, they can just have a written reply that shows how we're already doing the work. Thank you very much. But if you really need a discussion across different ministries, then all the ministries get together and we form a team, a ad hoc team that anyone can add other people in, but nobody can uh, subtract themselves out. So it's just like a ice bucket challenge. You can always add more ministries, but you cannot uh, talk your way out of it. And we then form a team that talks to the pre petitioner and the pre petitioner is facilitated through a open policy making toolkit to make sure that people's different positions are seen in a way that makes sure that everybody understand the overview of the issues. So every other Friday or so, we have a meeting of this kind and sometime live streamed, but always fully uh, radically transparent. And um, every other Monday after the uh, Friday, we send the summary of this meeting to the prime minister. And so the prime minister can look at the summary of the meeting and decide whether to just make it into policy or whether there is some reason we cannot make it into policy that we need to explain in full. So, so far, all the open collaboration meetings, uh, there's about 45 of open collaborations that we have run. About five, um, about 50 percent, about half of them turned into new policy or new initiatives, but half of them did not. And I will share with you uh, one case where it did not actually made into policy. Um, and it is about a petition that want to change the time zone of Taiwan to the same as Japan. So we are in GMT plus eight and the petition 8,000 people want to change it to GMT plus nine. Uh, and Taiwan's time zone has not been changed. So you can see that the petition did not actually succeed in effecting change. But that's because we also have another counter petition, again, 8,000 people asking Taiwan's time zone to remain at GMT plus eight. Uh, and so the, internally, we call it at the eight plus nine, ba jia jiu, uh, case. And this is very interesting because all the 16,000 people, it looked like they all have different positions. 
some of them say, oh, adopting a daylight saving time will save energy, will increase tourism, will increase commerce or whatever. But we actually made sure that all the ministries are in this game. And so they replied with factual cases of why it will not reduce energy, of what costs it will incur and things like that. And we invite people from both sides to the collaboration meeting. And it turns out after looking at all the facts and evidences, they can reveal their true feelings. And it turns out the reason why they really want the time zone to be changed is that they want people coming from Beijing or from Shanghai, from the PRC, when they arrive to the Taoyuan airport to force them to change the time zone so they can understand where different jurisdictions. But it's a very expensive way to do that. And it's also not very effective because Hong Kong has its own currency, right? And so there's many other countries that have many large time zones. And so it's not very effective. But then people see that it's not effective and then the cost that you will incur. And then they actually collaborated both sides on possible better uses uh, in the budget that will actually be deployed if we are going to change the time zone. And so it says that we're not faking the game. It is actually we find out the positives and we get to the common value. And the common value is that people want Taiwan to be seen as more unique in the world. And if we abstract to that shared value, actually people from both sides of the petition can agree with that value. And then we collaborated on how to spend a budget that would have been spent if it's actually a time zone change on more useful ways. Uh, and then people brainstorm a lot of very useful ways. For example, we should share the story that Taiwan is the only country in Asia that legalized marriage equality. Uh, we should put a lot of budget into spreading this fact. Um, we should put a lot of budget in the world, sharing that we have one of the highest uh, ratio of women in national parliament in our region. Of course, I know it's low in your region, but it's very high in our region. Uh, and also um, about how to do the different assessments on human rights, on gender and things like that. And so the end result is that everybody agreed on more useful ways to spend a budget to make Taiwan be seen as more unique, thus fulfilling the spirit of the petition, if not the text of the petition. And so this is very important that we actually meet eye to eye and face to face to brainstorm on the petition topic instead of acting purely on the text of the written petition. The next question is that uh, there's no digital minister at this time, even though similar coordinating minister was lobbied by some organizations. Well, Taiwan didn't have a digital minister either, right? But we always can have allies or champions in the government. It may be the prime minister, it may be the deputy prime minister. It used to be that I was just a kind of understudy digital minister at 2015. Uh, where I coordinated a lot of the work for, uh, with the GovZero community, with VTaiwan and so on. And so maybe we didn't need a digital minister back then because we have a shadow uh, government at the time uh, and we still have, and I'm still part of it. And the idea is very simple and I encourage you to try locally. All the government services in Taiwan ends in gov.tw. So you have something that gov, TW. And if the civil society think that it is not digital enough, for example, the budget in 2012 was 500 page of PDF files. It's impossible for the crowd to make sense of. So the civic hackers, the people in the social sector, just built exactly the same service, but with an old change to a zero. And so you don't have to buy any advertisement. You don't have to buy um, precision targeting on Facebook. You just build exactly the same website as your government, but change a O to a zero. And people by changing one letter in the URL get into the shadow government and you can have everybody serving as shadow digital ministers. And this really works because this is literally the first um, GovZero uh, project back in 2012. It's budget.g0v.tw. And as you can see, soon as I become the digital minister, everything is just merged back to the central government. You just saw the budget dashboard. That's exactly the same uh, idea and indeed shared code with the original GovZero prototype. And before the central government adopts it, 
actually in 2014, um, the Taipei city already adopted it. And sometimes it's easier to just convince a mayor or a municipal officer to adopt this idea. And then the central government sees it. And so it costs them nothing because all the GovZero projects are open source. It costs them nothing to merge it back. And so that makes it very much possible for the civil society to innovate without a digital minister by essentially spreading out, decentralizing the work of a digital minister. Uh, the next question um, from Timu is that I can see this working with a micro nation like Liberland, but very exciting to, to see this working in Taiwan. Amazing, isn't it? And, and Taiwan is actually geographically quite small. If you think about the north uh, of Taiwan, Taipei, to the southmost high-speed rail station, Kaohsiung, it's just one hour and a half. And so it is actually just a larger municipality geographically with high-speed rails, at least on the west side. Um, we're still working on the east side. But in any case, it feels like a, just a larger municipality, even if we're 23 million people. And I do agree that this geographic uh, closeness, proximity, it's very important to introduce innovations and have it spread easier to the entire population. Uh, someone asked, how do you encourage citizens involved in the process? Uh, our e-petition website actually recommend more uh, petitions to you, just like Amazon recommendations. And we also make sure that they're involved in, for example, um, choosing the uh, winners of the presidential hackathon. So presidential hackathon, is again a merge from GovZero. Um, it is used to be a idea that's still running called GovZero Grant. And after I become digital minister, we escalated uh, from the city level to the president's level. Basically, I talked to the president, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, uh, you can see Dr. Tsai Ing-wen here, uh, and it's always her platform uh, to be open in her uh, candidacy. She said uh, in her inauguration speech that democracy must move from being an opposition between two values into a conversation between diverse values. So she's very endorsing this idea of plurality and innovation from the social sector. So we convinced her to run the presidential hackathon. And this is a hackathon unlike anything else. You see here hackathon, maybe you hear, think about two days or three days of work, but presidential hackathon is three months of work. So it begins um, every April and the demo day is uh, mid July every year. So what is presidential hackathon? It is basically the president herself asking everyone to form data collaboratives to help delivering on her presidential promise. For example, uh, she, she promised a increasing of water resources efficiency. And by the way, our presidential promises and our cabinet promises are indexed using the sustainable development goals. So across the world, we can just say, oh, she promised the target 6-4, which is increasing water use efficiency. And this language works internationally. So last year, one of the five teams that won the presidential hackathon uh, implemented machine learning to let people detect water leakage faster than before using a chatbot. It used to be that the new water leakage is only detected uh, a few months, like seven months after each leak. But now with machine learning uh, and a chatbot that interact with the repair people, it's actually reduced to one tenth of the time. So it's a major uh, improvement. But the Taiwan Water Corporation only has the data. They don't have the algorithm and they don't have the regulatory expert to make it happen. And so in presidential hackathon, we coach 20 teams every year to become trilingual, to become teams that have the data and technology experts, the domain experts and the regulatory experts, usually public service. And once they become trilingual, they're given free roam to data and regulation and budget to try the idea for three months. And every year we pick five teams that win the hackathon. But how to select the 20 teams out of the hundreds or so uh, applications every year? We involve the people using a newly invented voting system called quadratic voting or QV. Everybody uh, um, receives through the e-petition platform 99 points. 
and you see 100, more than 100 projects, if you vote for one vote, you spend one point. And if you vote for two votes, you spend four points. If you vote some projects three vote, then you spend nine points, four vote, 16 points, and so on. And so given 99 points, you can at most vote nine votes on a project. What it does is that because this quadratic nature, it is actually prompting people to discover synergies between projects. And that is why we have a broad swath of selection instead of very narrow um, minded projects. We have projects that maximize the impact. And for the people who participate in quadratic voting, it also encouraged them to form alliances to learn more about each other's projects. And the five teams that wins every year receive a trophy from our president. And the trophy um, is a projector that if you turn on the projector, it shows the president handing the trophy to the team. And so it is very useful in internal negotiations because if your boss don't want the budget to be allocated, you can just project the president and you get the budget. Basically, what it symbolizes is the president's promise to the winning team that we will do whatever it takes in the next nine months to make the idea that your prototype in the three months a reality in public service. And we deliver on that of all the five teams that won last year. And so this year, it's now a national regulation that our five winning teams must uh, have their ideas written into the initiative and government programs in the next fiscal year. So there is no money as a reward. The reward is to have your prototype become public policy. I understand I only have one minute, so very quick answers um, to the three questions. Um, one person said that um, that I'm awesome, and I think your questions are all awesome. And Carolina uh, says that it's very inspirational, and I encourage you to talk more with uh, Shu Yang Ling, our co-founder in PIDES, to get further inspired. And finally, um, uh, Carolina are saying that even we think that uh, the percentage of women in national government can use some improvement, it is actually still very high. Uh, and our number, I think, should be higher. It should be more than 40%. But I really do think that it is um, the reason why we get more plurality in participation. It's just we have more open-minded lawmakers in general. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Audrey. It's so it's mind blowing every time I hear your talk. There's so many new ideas, but not only ideas, but new implementations. Um, so I think we have so much work to do here in Finland, and uh, your contribution is huge because now we have we have um, ways and methods how we can implement more participatory and transparent democracy. So thanks a bunch. One final question before me, we move on. So let's go back to the open government partnership meeting in uh, Ottawa in Canada. So what would be your, your main takeaway? Because it's a huge global meeting with all the practitioners coming from the open government sector from all over the world. Hello. So uh, great question. So my uh, main takeaway is that everybody is excited that Taiwan is launching our first open government national action plan in the uh, OGP forum because Taiwan is in a very interesting position that we're not a official member, just a partner, but we're also leading in the many uh, actions and commitments. So people see Taiwan as a new canvas to, ex to experiment with the NAP process. So NAP is usually two years, but we're talking about making it four years or three years, but basically a longer commitment from the presidency and a longer period, like more than half a year for the civil society to set the process, making the NAP itself a good collaboration framework for everybody. And we want this because if we only collaborate with people who already know about NAPs, it tends to be more about transparency, 
open data uh, or accountability, like open procurement. But this is great, of course, but they tend to be lacking on the inclusive participation part. So by expanding the NAP, so the process itself is a subject of co-creation. We want to be more inclusive of people who have never heard of open government, who didn't really know what the sustainable development is, who don't have any idea of the national government and how it works. We also want these people's voice in getting into the NAP process. And we have a lot of volunteers across the world who want the NAP process to be better, to be willing to visit Taiwan as experts to continue to evolve the NAP process. And maybe we can contribute that back to the LGP in a couple of years. That's the main takeaway. Hmm. That sounds wonderful. And congratulations on your, on your work on that. So thank you so much, Audrey. Let's give you um, a round of applause. Thank you. It was great to have you here. And thanks a lot for all your um, work on resolving the final technical issues too, because just a couple of minutes the event was about to start, we couldn't hear or see anything. So this is a major success in that way. So thank you so much. Let's stay in touch. And now we're going to move into a virtual reality with uh, Xu Yang. Thank you. So next, what we are going to do is that we are going to learn about a really fascinating democratic innovation, a series of experiment with a platform called Holopolis, which uh, Xu Yang Li have, has been working on. and. Uh, she is a co-founder of the, the, pub, the Public Digital Innovation Lab at the Taiwanese government. So she has been working closely with Audrey on that. And now actually Xu Yang has moved to Europe, to UK a couple of months ago, and she's continuing her work there. And she has done really great job in taking the Taiwanese open source Unity platform for virtual reality and then uh, customizing it for us here for the Finnish environment. So we actually see some in, in environment, environment here from Audi 360 video and then the Holopolis uh, decision making platform in VR. But first, uh, Xu Yang is going to talk about the background of the project and show a little bit about the, uh, the context. And then after that, we are going to transition into the actual demo. So there we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to this? Okay. Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Thanks. Okay. Good. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Shri Yang from Taiwan also. You can probably tell it's very fun to, to work with Audrey. Um, just get all the fun <laughs> and uh, um, hang out with people in the government and also outside of government uh, facilitating uh, workshops and making VR games. So today um, I'm going to present one of the little demo or little experiments we are building in Taiwan. Uh, it's an idea about bringing uh, public deliberation into VR space using virtual reality. Um, uh, this might sound like a very futuristic idea, but we actually have been using that for quite a few, quite a few cases. Uh, in the beginning, we thought um, online deliberation was difficult, um, and we somehow made it. And we had some examples around 40 to 50 of the case studies. And after a while, we kind of got bored of websites, and we thought, why don't we try VR? So we uh, started this experiment. Um, um, I probably will. Uh, started from how this project actually came about. Uh, Eldry actually did mention uh, the civic tech community in Taiwan, Coke of Zero. Um, and also she mentioned one of the big uh, movement called Forking the Government, which is when she talked about changing the URL from O to Zero and making the shadow government. So we call that movement Forking the Government because we're uh, forking the entire uh, governmental public websites into another another copy of, uh, of, uh, of other websites um, that is more uh, open source, more open data on top, and uh, more mo most of the time more beautiful. Um, and the civic, te civic hackers in Taiwan, they gather every uh, two months or so um, since uh, 2000, in the early 2000s. Um, and every two months they gather and just kind of brainstorm about ideas they want to change or better iterate the democracy in Taiwan. And one of the ideas we, we, we kind of um, thought about and have been building for almost five years now is called V Taiwan. It's a project um, 
um, experimenting on open consultation process, which means, uh, I think the process here, which means we, uh, as citizens, we can propose any kind of idea. And after uh, proposing an idea, we'll try to gather opinions from online and offline. So meaning we'll launch a website to gather people's opinion. Um, but also we'll uh, organize open events, hackathons, uh, this kind of hackathon is more frequently organized. So every week, actually every Wednesday evening, we'll organize a V Taiwan hackathon uh, for people whoever want to join, just like the event here, wh whoever want to join and talk about their opinions, thoughts, ideas, or just want to hang out with pizza, they can just come and gather. Uh, and after that, we'll reflect on their ideas. Um, also, we'll kind of reach out to people online who are more active. Uh, uh, online uh, to come to to a consultation meeting and thought about what kind of proposals uh, we can start drafting to to the parliament. So Vita One is a project like that, uh, drafting focusing on digital regulations and um, and taking uh, opinions from whoever interested and then sending that to to the parliament. Um, the technology behind. Um, if you haven't thought about that, um, many people in the beginning would assume the technology could be very difficult or complicated, um, but it's actually very easy. We simply use a lot of open source tools, so like Headpad, um, Discourse, GitHub, uh, and um, we also do live streaming uh, many times, uh, most of the time through YouTube, but just using free accounts. Um, so just using a lot of free tools, uh, gather all of them together, uh, Vita One is actually possible to, to be built. And one of the open source uh, tool we use quite often is called uh, Polis. It's the blue, blue, um, blue, blue uh, icon over here. It's called Polis. And Audrey also talked a little bit about it. It's a um, uh, kind of AI-powered um, deliberation tool online where everyone, everyone can uh, log in online and uh, talk about their ideas, opinions. And, um, and then the AI behind will calculate uh, a rough consensus of all these people and suggest major opinions. Um, I can go into more detail about this, but I want to show you some pictures of the hackathon just now. Um, so basically the hackathon environment is very relaxing. People just hang out and have pizza. We always order pizza, always uh, bring Coke. And I think it's quite influenced by Western culture. Um, we <laughs> sometimes order some, some Eastern food as well. Um, but basically people just hang out and sit around their favorite food. Uh, I was really surprised in the beginning because I thought people would come and just sit around different topics, but actually they just kind of gather according to what kind of favorite food they have. Um, and uh, from from the from the face to face meeting, people kind of just talk about their feelings. Uh, for example, the current politics, the current uh, regulations they don't really like, or current um, policies that uh, they get benefit from. And all these feelings they talk about, we also try to visualize them online as well. So we're creating a, if you talk about special design, we're creating an online, offline, kind of very closely linked space. Um, people, um, whoever have an opinion, um, can uh, log their opinion online. If they don't feel like logging online, other people can also help them out. Um, it's as flexible as that, um, and we we use Polis. Uh, this interface is Polis interface. We use Polis a lot to to visualize feelings. So on the top of interface, you can um, check how other people's uh, opinions, and in the center, you can type in your own opinions or feelings. And the lower button, uh, lower section, uh, is the section where uh, the AI behind uh, is trying to uh, help us visualize the the feelings. The algorithm is actually called PCA, uh, Principal Component Analysis. Um, so many people could be very familiar with that. It's just um, pointing out the most uh, principal component and see that as a major opinion. Um, um, we also uh, talk about this uh, diagram, uh, but the cool thing over here is every conversation we launched on v Taiwan. Um, so for example, we talk about, uh, say, Online, online healthcare, one of the example, one of the regulation reforms about online healthcare. Uh, in the beginning, people do have a lot of different um, decisive, uh, de divisive, sorry, divisive statements. 
But uh, after a certain time, normally in average, it's, it's around two weeks to two months, people start to have more uh, consensus statements. Uh, one of the reasons to be said is uh, what Audrey also mentioned is uh, there's no reply button on the, on the website. So we call this phenomenon from, uh, from reply to rewrite. That's because as a user looking at this website, if you want to say something uh, instead of replying to other people's co comments, the only thing you can do is actually come up with a better comment. Right? So in that way, instead of replying, uh, you're actually trying to rewrite a more constructive statement uh, and contributing to the conversation. And after we uh, see this kind of um, phenomenon, <laughs> we just thought, OK, it's great. We just remove all the reply button on the website. And then it actually worked out. So as the project goes on, normally two months, um, uh, you can see the, the diagram will move from, uh, sorry, from, from like this end. Uh, more, these old dots are, these black dots are all uh, statements. Uh, you can see the statements move from one end, more divisive end, to a more consensus end. And that's quite interesting uh, kind of movement as well, very small movement on its own. Um, and then after that, uh, this is the stage where we, we call um, uh, gathering opinions. So after gathering opinions, we simply just, we just take uh, those major uh, consensus uh, opinions and uh, invite people behind these opinions and people kind of highly against these opinions to come to the same meeting room, have that meeting room also uh, live stream to the internet. So it's also a, a kind of um, focused but public meeting. And in that consultation meeting, we'll have them to discuss about what um, draft bill we can write and send it to the parliament. So this process is very... Um, very, I think it's very flexible. It's not very difficult. Uh, it lasts probably, in average, from two months to a year. Um, but you don't actually have to do many things all the time. Uh, it's actually like some meetings sometimes, and you go to hackathon sometimes, try to get updated from the, from the issues sometimes. Um, and after a while, we kind of run through around, when the day we run through around 26 cases and uh, got 24 of them actually ratified into regulations, uh, we just thought, okay, we'll start doing something more fun. Um, and that's where Holopolis came from. So thinking about uh, all the V Taiwan movement or V Taiwan um, uh, experiment we have done since the past, uh, for the past five years, since last year, uh, actually two, two years ago around, the winter, um, we started to uh, think about what if we bring people even closer together. So Vita One is a platform where people can can talk uh, on the internet, on websites, uh, sometimes in the meeting room, sometimes on live stream platforms. But what if we can bring people, uh, even say grandfather, grandfathers or grandmothers, even closer to, together, even without asking them to work to walk for for a long distance. Uh, that's when we thought about VR, uh, although it sounds like very hacky, very techy. Um, sounds like people do need the device, but if we imagine a future where VR headsets is just as easy to get as computers uh, or as smartphones, then why don't we imagine that kind of futures already and uh, bring the public deliberation into VR? So here we go. We try to like have lots of experiment also in the beginning, just kind of little add-ons uh, add to improve V Taiwan's uh, experiment. So we try to bring V Taiwan's conversation not only uh, on the website, uh, we build API and also we uh, connect the conversation to, to smartphone, to apps. To, so this experiment is connecting um, V Taiwan conversation uh, to uh, a chatbot. Uh, so you can actually add uh, a chatbot on Skype or on uh, Hangout and just talk to the chatbot say, hey, what is the uh, public issue on undergoing right now? And I want to participate and I can kind of give my opinion on it. And the second um, the second uh, experiment we tried out also, uh, I think this last year's project, is imagining um, uh, when everyone has a HoloLens, uh, maybe a contact lens on, on the streets. Uh, so when you, whenever you bump into a public deliberation, kind of situated deliberation. So for example, uh, if we're talking about um, on the metro, there are some priority seats. 
And in Taiwan, there's one of the debate about whether we should keep or or remove the priority seat because everyone should be respected. So whenever you see elderly, you should actually just give seats. Um, so we actually had that kind of debate. Um, and um, so I was thinking, okay, maybe we can just, uh, whenever we see something interesting on the spot, we can already talk about it. Um, so we create this little um, uh, demo to to um, bring that conversation into uh, that location on, on the metro. Um, and uh, the last experiment, um, um, it's called uh, Holopolis Hi-Fi. Uh, it's actually the, the demo I'm going to show uh, here today, later on. If you are interested, you can come have a look. Uh, it's imagining a virtual commons where uh, when everyone can all log into the share space to, uh, to really gather in person and uh, to have meaningful discussion in that space. And also still feel uh, the autonomous uh, the autonomy to uh, to discuss uh, when whenever you want wherever you want uh, and whatever you want also because the space in VR is actually just enormous unlimited um, so uh, in this demo um, we used the um, the the topic that uh, Tanya professor professor uh, uh, suggested it's very related to Finland, I think, <laughs> and uh, we use the environment here, Aldi, and um, uh, on, on, in this demo you can see uh, the background is uh, the Aldi library, and because we, I, what I understand is we we're imagining Aldi to be a public space where people can talk about public issues, and probably later on in the future. Uh, there will be some uh, meetings uh, around reforming policy as well. So we're imagining, okay, if we can make one example and show, uh, you can also do that uh, in the form of VR, that would be awesome. So we use this case uh, and set the background to Audis library. Um, so here on the interface, in the beginning, uh, okay, yeah, sorry, I, I, was, I was trying to explain. So in, in the interface before, uh, uh, you, basically you can see other people's comments and also you can put your comments inside. Um, so in this VR experience, uh, we try to redesign the interface and we bring, we kind of bring uh, those contents of, uh, sorry, contents of those topics uh, onto the VR uh, experience screen. And um, when you enter, the experience or the game, uh, you can see other people's comment. So like this one, and you can vote for yes, no, or pass. It's actually okay to say, I don't know, I have no idea uh, what, what should I say yes or no about this question. Uh, so you can vote for yes, or no, or pass. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, your idea will be um, uh, accumulated and calculated by the program behind. And it's actually using police as a back end. Okay, so uh, what we are trying to do here, uh, actually this demo is more interesting than it looks because it's, it's very beginning of the, of the implementation. Um, but what we're trying to do here is to build a recursive public, uh, which actually means uh, collecting people's uh, wisdom, intelligence, opinions, ideas um, into the shared environment where it's open and everyone can access to it. So we are collecting all our feelings and thoughts around a uh, certain issue and try to uh, use um, computer, meaning AI or uh, machine learning behind as the collaborative tool to help us reach a rough consensus so we can collectively thought about how we can improve our society. And this experiment uh, has been forked in different places. So like uh, Tokyo, Toronto, and New York. Uh, we've been trying to, to demo this uh, very interesting idea. Um, and um, I think in, in this way, we can try to start, uh, we can, we can, we can uh, start to uh, really co-create on um, very some, somehow sometimes very innovative, uh, very kind of seeing too much in the future ideas, but somehow we can uh, start to document all of them and start to think about, okay, what is the shared common value for all of us uh, in the future? Um, 
So uh, in this demo, we're probably targeting on one of the SDG goals, which is the SDG number seven about uh, co-creation. Um, yeah, and this is it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shiyang. Thanks. I, sh I think I saw an earlier version of the demo um, sometime in Madrid, um, I think last summer or summer before when we gave a talk in the same conference. So it's really fascinating to see now the demo localized here in, in Finland and at Audi and with the current uh, the law reform process of the Association Act. Uh, any questions to Xu Yang at this point? We can always ask questions during the demo too. So I think right now, let's uh, transition to the demo. So whoever is interested, feel free to walk here and we'll get you set up with the headset. We have seven different headsets, so seven different people can try it at the same time. And uh, what, did you, what do you think about the app props? Maybe five minutes or something per person to kind of figure it out, to look around and so on. And meanwhile, if you're not interested in the demo or if you um, just want to stay in the queue for a while, um, you can hang um, hang out here and ask questions, come and talk to us or talk to Xu Yang. So um, with this, I want to thank you, everybody who was here and also all of the people who are following the live stream. And I think the live stream will be going on for a while. So we leave the cameras on for now. So thank you so much. Let's uh, go to the demo. Um, so the same uh, in Finnish, sama suomeksi, eli kuka on kiinnostunut demosta, tulkaa vaan tänne eteen, me saadaan seitsemän eri ihmistä demoon yhtä aikaa, ja sitten muut voi odottaa tai tulla juttelemaan meille, tai muuten vaan hengailla. Yeah, maybe if you take the one of the the mics so everybody can hear over here, maybe this one. You can talk to the mic or the news. Okay. So um, inside you can see um, the the library thing. Um, so you can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but but yes, you really need need some kind of. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can just grab it. Uh, um. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Has anyone it's it's Oculus Go. Because uh, it needs. Um, yeah, let's try to do it simultaneously. Okay. So here's one. Worse, this one mm -hmm. is. Um, All right. I think the first the first person can. But it needs to pair up with the controller. So that's what I like. Yeah, it needs to so go this to one. The, the right controller. Okay. So I think the first one you can actually. Uh, what's your name? Thomas. Oh, you're Thomas. Okay, so <laughs> you can actually see uh, kind of all the uh, libraries sing inside, and you can probably see um, a controller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can hold it, and you can put your thumb on the touchpad and choose agree, disagree, or disagree or pass. Okay. Yeah, um, and it, it actually should be connected to Wi-Fi, but somehow here it doesn't have. Yeah, we access. had a uh, bad luck, so the yeah. Wi-Fi is not working in this room. In this room. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Today. Okay. So. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, sh sh okay. So. Should we go outside? Um, yeah. Should we go to outside? Y yeah, to we can go uh, okay. outside. Yeah. Because that's where it works. But if you yeah. give the instructions here, okay. So then everybody knows what we're doing, and and if we take. Uh, no, those ones are broken. Sorry. 
So those ones with yellow posties are broken. Ah, OK. Yeah. The other ones are worse. Yeah, they were okay. try to pair them with the <laughs> right <laughs> controller. <laughs> OK. OK. And then Let's do that. you try, and then you come back in, and you switch to the next person. Yeah, that's a good idea. OK. All right, sorry for the chaos. So I'll try to go through what you should see inside. And uh, we can go outside, we can go connect to the Wi-Fi together. And uh, I'll be with you guys to, to see properly, OK? So what you should see inside is, uh, is uh, um, the 360 video of Audi here. And uh, you'll see uh, a conversation about um, uh, association act. And you can uh, see other people's opinions. And you can click on agree, disagree, or pass. That should be it. Uh, after we connect to Wi-Fi, it should work very, very well. OK, so let's. Yeah, and uh, did you mention the 360 video? Yeah, yes, yeah, OK. Just uh, yeah, just a quick note from our really great video crew. Thanks, uh, Antti and, and his colleagues from Bright Group. So they reminded me that maybe at this point we switch off from the live stream. So thanks a lot to everybody who has been following live stream. Um, I'll see you um, online, maybe on our Facebook uh, site or Twitter. Or so if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at any time. Mm. Thank you so much. Let's wait for a bit and wait for a bit and so should I take this off? Then?